thank you for being here and uh, the stage is yours. Yes, so th thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Like uh, each time I'm coming to Italy, I'm very impressed by the quality of the talk. Uh, it's really great. So I will speak about uh, technical developments in optics that we are uh, uh, achieving since many years. I will, at the end of the talk, I mean, the second part of the talk, show you different applications. I will maybe go fast over the different applications and we can discuss uh, later on those applications. And I like you to, to I, I like to be detailed and explain where, well the motivation and how it works. So I will focus on the optical part. So yeah, it's called 3D Cache. So it's not my uh, invention, it's the invention of my collaborator, Stefan Dieudonné, uh, who like acronyms. And uh, it's uh, referred to custom address serial holography. And it's, uh, the aim is to record fast in 3D the activity of neurons in uh, behaving animals. So you saw, and it, it helped me a lot, you saw a very nice talk uh, previously, so it will help me to introduce this field and also the application in the visual cortex. So most of the application in two-photo microscopy aims at recording the activity in head behaving animals using uh, a strategy of scanning, which is called raster scanning, where you scan the whole field of view. And it has a uh, limitation in terms of the frame rate you can achieve. So I wrote 100 hertz, but typically, in fact, you reach 10 hertz of the order because you need a significant signal to noise ratio to see the small calcium transient evoked by calcium activity. Um, and uh, it is not easy in those techniques to, at the same time, record from large neuronal ensembles, like in the images shown before, where you wanted to address thousand, hundred, thousand, or ten thousand neurons, at the same time have a good temporal resolution, and especially, especially in 3D, if you want to see the activity of a whole cortical column. So to address this question, a long time ago, uh, I developed techniques to perform what's called uh, random access scanning. So it's not random at all, but that's the name, where you scan targeted points in the field of view by jumping very fast from one point to the other one, and it helps to increase the, uh, the sampling frequency and also the signal to noise ratio because you spend much more time on the point of interest. That was the idea, okay? And this is made, I will come back later to, on acoustic deflectors. So in fact, uh, to be honest, this technique has been developed by my group and by the group of someone you know very well, which is uh, Peter Sagal in particular, who works uh, for a long time at uh, IIT. And, um, but you don't see them so much in lab uh, for one main reason, which is the second one shown here, which is the problem of motion artifacts. Because when you work on head fixed animals, you have brain motion, at least in 2D, even in 3D. And when you do uh, images, you can compensate uh, post uh, imaging by doing correlation, those motion artifacts. And if you do random scanning of few points, you are really in, uh, in trouble with motion artifacts. So that prevents the, the, the spread of this technique, even though they provide good temporal resolution, that prevented the, the, the spread of those techniques. And the second thing is that we solve the problem in a sense for 3D, for 2D scanning, but not for 3D. So here, what I want to show you is how we can address this question of fast sampling in 3D, and at the same time, because you will see that both will be solved simultaneously to record safely in head fixed animals without being disturbed by motion artifacts. So to address this question, many groups have tried different methods. So the, the one which you, you have seen is to do a full frame scan, but it's, it's slow. It, it has to be slow because you, you, you do images slow, you scan in 3D slow. So people have tried to do micro frame. So you do small micro frames around the neuron of interest. So it allows to be uh, less sensitive to motion artifacts, but still you lose temporal resolution. And what we aim to do is to do fast random access scan in 3D with that's uh, the word point and shoot. So you just send light on the point of interest, on the neuron of interest. So you lose images. You are not doing an image an anymore. You do uh, points information in 3D. So to do that, the idea is to use acoustic deflectors and uh, I'll spend time to explain how it works because at the heart of the technique. So acoustic deflectors, you put an ultrasonic wave and it diffracts light at a given angle. And if you change the frequency, you change the angle, so it is a, a scanning system, okay? So the uh, angle is related to the frequency in the LD and in the wavelength of light, okay? So it's quite easy, but in fact, it raises many difficulties. And as an example for the student, when I started this, I didn't read a book written by the inventor of two-photo microscopy, Winfried Deng, and hopefully I didn't read it because he wrote in the book that they could not be used in two-photo microscopy because there are many difficulties. And he was right, there were many difficulties, but I was right not to read it because I would have not done the, all those experiments. We solved those issues, sorry, we solved those issues, I won't speak about that, 
There are some um, temporal dispersion, some spatial dispersion, some low angle scanning, whatever, whatever. We solve most of those issues, which are not so complicated, but make those systems a bit more complicated to use than simple mirrors, okay? And in fact, in particular, the group of uh, Peter Sagal has shown that you can not only do uh, 2D scans like this, but also you can focus with AOD. So instead of putting a wave at constant frequency, you put a wave with a varying frequency and you can focus light. So it's very appealing to do 3D scan because it's also a lens in fact an AOD. Okay? And in fact, it is even more. So we, we published that a couple of years ago. If you put a, a pattern of frequency, so you, you, you have a generator of uh, frequency in the AOD, you put a complex pattern of frequency, it will modify the wavefront of the light in a manner which is related to the pattern of frequency. So we derive the equation. It's a bit complicated, but not so complicated. The derivative of the phase of the wavefront is di directly proportional to the frequency at, at that point in the AOD. So in fact, an AOD potentially is a wavefront shaper. So it means something which you can use to scan in X, in Y, in Z, but you can also create complex waveform at the exit of the AOD to manipulate light, to, to create patterns, whatever. So that sounds appealing, but there is a problem. It's not a real wavefront shaper like the ones you may know, which are spatial light modulator with liquid crystal, okay? And the problem is the following, is the fact that, in fact, you cannot, you, so you can have a, a, a wave at constant frequency in the AOD, but if you have a wave with a varying frequency, the wave varies across time, so at a certain time, that is what you have in the AOD, but a, a bit later, to keep the same gradient of frequency, you have the frequency that has changed in the AOD, okay? So the mean frequency has changed, the gradient is the same, but the mean frequency has changed. So for example, to create a focus, okay, you will keep the same focus, but the, the, the main frequency, the central frequency has changed, so it means that you have scan, okay? So that creates something complicated, and that was, and, and at the end, at one point, the AOD, you, I mean, you cannot vary frequency forever, it has a certain bandwidth, so you have to reset frequency to start with new frequency, so you lose time, you, you have some drawback effect until you, you, you can again put your gradient of frequency. So to solve that issue, different groups in uh, Hungary, Peter Sago and so on, uh, had the idea to uh, couple the two AODs, uh, where, so I won't go into the details of that, uh, so that was a very nice experiment with opposite frequencies, so it should move at one point, oh, sorry, I maybe have to, oh, anyhow, it's not from, yeah. Uh, so you have two AODs with varying frequencies, here opposite, in opposite direction, and at a certain time, what you get in the AOD is a focus in between the two AOD, and you compensate the two scanning. And if I can manage to have this running, yeah, maybe it'd be nicer. Yes, so you see you can scan, but at one point you have to reset the frequency. So you obtain a fixed focus, which is beautiful at a certain position, but at one point you have to reset the frequencies in the AOD, so you, you have a duty cycle which is not optimal. And at the same time, the second AOD is not used in the proper configuration, which is called the BRAC configuration, where you have maximum diffraction. And one limitation of those systems is the fact compared to mirror, mirror are perfect, you have a reflection which is perfect. In AOD, it's diffraction by the system, so you, lo use, you lose light in the AOD. So this system is nice, but has some drawbacks. So since many years, I had in mind to find a solution to this problem, to, s to, to use more efficiently AOD in, in, in this configuration. So I came up with a solution which is very simple, in fact, uh, but costs a lot of money, but it's very simple, as often. You like simple solutions, so it's uh, simple and expensive. Uh, so <laughs> it's, uh, it, in fact, it's the idea that all the, our problem is the fact that the wave is propagating. So it means that different pulses in the laser sees different patterns. So what we decided is to slow down the repetition rate of the laser so that it is synchronized with the establishment of the wave in the AOD. So this is what is shown here. You put a certain wave to go at a certain position x, y. You put a new wave and then you send a pulse to go at a certain position x, y, z, and so on, and so on, and so on. And in between, you establish a wave but you don't send pulses, okay? So we have synchronized the laser at a low repetition rate. Typically, we go from 100 megahertz in standard laser to 100 kilohertz with those new laser which are uh, regenerative amplifiers, okay? So of course, this is nice, it works perfectly. You have a system now which where it is frozen, the wave in the AOD, so you have a wavefront, you have a pattern of ultrasonic frequency that you apply at a certain time, and it creates a wavefront which is stable for a single pulse, and then for the new pulse, you create a new wavefront, okay? But it has a cost, it has a cost that you need a laser, 
where the pulse are more rare, and this is expensive because this pulse has to be very energetic. Because instead of having, well, usually you have 2,000 times more pulses per second, in a sense. So it means that you need to create as much fluorescence with a single pulse here as compared to the previous situation that you are used to in standard systems. Okay? So you, we need to use those type of laser, which are <coughs> expensive but are getting more popular thanks to three photomicroscopy, in fact, and which provide high energy pulses to your system. Okay? But thanks to that, we have a system now where with a, a, a AOD scanners, we can address point in space, x, y, z, or any wavefront shaping, and I will show you the application, uh, at a rate which is very large, at the rate of the laser. So typically, we can move a point in space in 3D at a repetition rate, in our case, of 40 kilohertz. So every 25 microseconds, we can address a different point in space. Okay? So of course, this would not be accessible at all with standard galvanometers and piezo system or whatever system to move the objective in Z. Okay? So these microscopes that we call 3D cache allows to scan a volume. So just to give you an example, you can put the point in a volume. So it depends. I won't go into the detail. You, you can access a volume which is of the order of 500 micrometers in X, X, Y, and Z. And you can put your point in this volume every 25 microseconds wherever you want to excite fluorescence. Okay? And you can do complex wavefront shaping. And yeah, I'm just showing that you can create aberrations. And to be honest, is not real SLM, so it's a special light modulator that works at 40 kilohertz, okay? So much faster than any SLM, most, most of the SLM, but it's not a 2D SLM, it's 1D in the X direction and 1D in the Y direction, so it's 1D plus 1D, it's not 2D. So you can do, for example, for aberration, you can do any type of aberration, you can do just aberration which has a phase which, dep a phase which depend on X and a phase which depend on Y. Okay. So why is it useful? So as I said, it allows to do 3D recording potentially with a very high temporal resolution. Okay, now I don't care it's 2D or 3D. I send a pulse every 25 microseconds wherever I want in, in a cortical column. But also, as I said, it's really important to get rid of those motion artifacts. So the strategy we had is the following. So we want to scan in 3D, but we won't scan with a point. Okay, if we have a point, it means that if those points are moving when the animal is doing a task, the, the, the laser pulse will not reach a point and you will get fluctuations in the signal you're recording from which will are going to be much larger than the signal expected from functional activity. So what we do, in fact, is to do at the same time with the same, th with a single AOD, so to apply phase to address in 3D, so uh, X, Y, and Z, okay, plus holography that you may know from application in optogenetics to pattern the wavefront so that you have a, a an intensity distribution in the focal plane, which is not a diffraction emitted spot, but an extended spot, okay? So what we do as an extended spot is the following. So we do a series of, at the same time, a pattern of, of many spots, okay? So typically what we choose at the end is a pattern of five by five spots, so 25 spots, so which have an extension which is uh, of the order of the cell body, but even larger, I will explain why. So in fact, to do that, we create an hologram, so wavefront, so we put frequencies in each AOD to create an hologram by the equation I gave you, d5 divided by dx equal f, okay? And this hologram is optimized to create this pattern, okay? So what we do, in fact, is two things. So this pattern is created to such that it enlarges the focus so that the cells remain in the, f in the focal excitation when the animal is moving, okay? So what, and I will show you it later, so what we do is we create a focus which is very, it's quite large, typically of the order of motion artifacts, so that the cell move within this pattern, okay? But of course, what you want to record from is not that isolated cell, you want to specifically record the activity of this soma and not to be contaminated to all what is surrounding the cell, which is a, a classical problem in, in functional imaging. So what you do, what we do is that for to at you, you send one pulse shape like this to have an information about somatic activity but contaminated by the surrounding and then the next pulse we send it seen on this neuron but with a pattern which is like this one two lines to sample the activity around the neuron at about the same time and then we will subtract this activity from this one to create to, to obtain the activity specific to the cell body of that neuron so for the holography 
sorry, we use very classical holography method, in fact, so we adapt what's called Gershberg and Texan algorithm, which has been a lot used in uh, optogenetic to target this type of patterning, but we, we apply them to frequency in the and not to, to phase, but it's exactly the same, and it works nicely, so it's not obvious to see an AOD like this, but we can create, so maybe I'll show just the example at the end, we can create, so here is there is no holography, that's the spot in X, Y, and it's Z, Z elongation, and for example, we can create four by four patterns, and you see that it, it's nicely working with, uh, so that's the, the, the emission, so it's a two photo effect, uh, we have a nice confinement and an extended pattern, okay, and, and, and so on. So when we do the recordings, what you can see is the following, so the idea is the following, is to have uh, an animal on a wheel, uh, we can record neurons at different depths at the same time, more or less. We have estimated the motion artifacts that we get at different depths during our surgery, depending on the speed, and we will create patterns on the side which is of the order of this uh, motion artifact. Okay? And the neuron across time is going to move within this pattern, but still will be illuminated and still will produce fluorescence. And uh, so Walter, who did all these experiments, Walter Ackerman, showed here typically the result, which is impressive in fact, uh, here you see uh, what he did is to, to demonstrate the efficiency of this strategy to do uh, motion artifact compensation. He interleaves excitation with a single pulse diffraction limited at the center of the cell on three cells with a pulse which is specially patterned. And what you see here, so it's recorded exactly at the same time, okay, with a delay of 25 microseconds. And here you see what you obtain if you are not doing special shaping, okay, so strong motion artifacts, so it's a gadget GFP mice where you don't expect to see any signals, okay. So this is uh, huge variations, you see the scale, so you won't see calcium activity, G-comp activity on such uh, by baseline, okay? And if you did uh, do this excitation and sum up the, 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 of course, you sum up the fluorescence coming from all those points, you see this very stable baseline, which is uh, almost uh, artifact free, uh, even at when the animal is, is running, if that's a running event. So here, you can do functional imaging, okay? So it works nicely. So, um, in fact, to be, and I don't want to be too long, uh, it allows also to suppress the neuropil contamination, okay? So by doing this, so we record both, so here you see the neuropil activity in blue, the so e e um, estimate from this pattern. You see here in dark, the somatic activity e uh, uh, measured by this pattern, and we develop different type, oops, sorry. Uh, oh no. Sorry, and we develop different algorithm to subtract the neuropil activity in blue from the somatic activity in dark to get something which is somatic specific activity. So we use an algorithm uh, developed in the Kenetaris lab, for example, in the past by looking at the correlation of the two. We develop also an algorithm that minimizes the standard deviation of the, the, of, of the corrected trace. In both cases, we obtain something very similar and which is an activity which is not neuropil free. I don't claim it's perfect, but it's well corrected from the neuropil activity. And the second thing which is important is the fact that in fact, I, I said rapidly that by using very high energy pulses, which are a bit dangerous to use, we can collect as much fluorescence as we want. Of, of course, it's false. We are saturating the fluorescence if we do that. We cannot multiply fluorescence uh, infinitely. So by, special sh uh, by, by increasing uh, the, the, the spread of the, the, of the PSF, we collect fluorescence from a larger volume from all the cells instead of a single spot. So we mitigate saturation of fluorescence too, and it's, it's very helpful. Okay, so um, is it clear? That, the, that the, the principle of the method, it allows to record in head fixed animals without motion artifacts or very few motion artifacts with neuropil, um, uh, um, sorry, with uh, suppression of neuropil contamination, the activity of typically uh, 100 cell at 100 hertz, or even more, okay? So that's uh, the order of magnitude, okay? So it's much faster than what you could get with other techniques. So I will show you rapidly different example application. Um, I don't have time to go in detail. I, I will go fast, and then I am open to question and to discussion afterwards. So to, to show the technique, we use a visual cortex. So now you know everything about the visual cortex. So record, for example, here an example of recording across the depths of, of, of V1 at different depths of uh, few, uh, typically 100 cells uh, at sampling rate of 250 Hz. 
okay, at different depths. The cells are here in layer either two, three, or layer five. And you see the typical trace that we get and the spike that we detect uh, using uh, deconvolution algorithms from the ML spike algorithm. So to be a bit more accurate, uh, do we detect single spikes? No, uh, it's difficult to detect single spikes. So it, it is GCOM6 at that time. We haven't used GCOM8, which is uh, better now. Uh, typically, this is uh, depending on the threshold, uh, the amount of hits, so the, the true spikes and the myths that we get. So we did uh, uh, electrode current recordings together with, with uh, functional imaging. And what you see that for uh, two APs or three APs within a short window, you can detect quite easily the activity, but for a single spike, it's very difficult. But this we face, I mean, everybody faced the difficulty in the field. Uh, hopefully, maybe with GCOMP8, it will be a bit better. We can record the signals you were recording more or less. So in V1, you can record the activity while presenting gratings. And we recover what people are recovering. That's why I'm going maybe fast on this part to show you a few more examples. Uh, the, the tuning of the cells. So we, we were uh, focusing on orientation preference in that case. We found that there were uh, orientation, orientation selectivity angles, no maps, uh, and so on, which is classical in this area. We saw that activity was strongly modulated by locomotion, something which has been studied in detail in the lab where you are coming from by Matthew Carandini. Uh, and that, in fact, if you look at a single trial response, they are very variable depending on, on velocity speed on awake animals. And if you go to uh, anesthet anesthetized animal, you get very much more strong and reliable uh, responses, which is also something which is known. Uh, we also so that we can look at uh, sensitivity to the phase of the grating for the cells. We found cells like this one, which is extremely phase sensitive, which means that when uh, the grating uh, goes through the receptive field as shown before, you have a response which is modulated and sounds to the speed of our recording. You can do that in 3D and look at cell sensitivity, phase sensitivity of the cells in the visual cortex. And we found, and I'll go fast, cells which are phase sensitive and cells which are much less sensitive, which not a bimodal distribution because the statistical set is not working, but more or less bimodal. Interestingly, since we have this good number resolution, even though GCAMP is not extremely fast, we can look at uh, correlation uh, structure of the neural activity. So we can measure the pairwise correlation uh, in a given recording. And what we found, interestingly, is that uh, in all recordings, there were always a component, uh, in principal component uh, analysis of the correlation matrix, which at Opposite, uh, uh, which has coefficient of opposite signs between neuron in layer two, three, and neuron in layer five, Sh and this is was true when you do that for all experiments, all animals in awake and isoferent situation, showing that there was some sort of higher synchronicity within layer than across layers. And to confirm that, we did a master follow spike analysis where we look at the probability for each master spike in a layer in a neuron, whether it is in layer two, three, or layer five to see where the following spike was most probably found. And we found that it was always found in the same layer at the one uh, of the master spike. So it showed that there is an organization of activity with more synchronous activity within layer than across layer, which is maybe not a uh, huge result, but show that the technique allows to get information about uh, <coughs> um, uh, temporal organization of the activity. And thanks to this, and I won't speak about that also, uh, but I'm uh, uh, happy to discuss, we can start to build model of uh, functional connectivity. It has nothing to do with what we sh you showed before. It's not looking at the detailed true connectivity of neurons, but try to build models of the network based on the, connect of the correlation that you uh, recover. Okay? And for example, we're interested in a collaborator which is called Rémi Monasson and Simona Coco, which obviously is from Italy, um, to design what's called restricted Boltzmann machine model, which is model which are nice, and I'm very happy to, sp to, to speak about that because there are not really deep learning models where you have many layers and you don't know what you do. It's simple models where you have just a one visible unit, which are the neurons you are recording from, and a layer, which is the hidden units, which uh, help to mimic the activity and the correlation that you measure in the structure. So this type of model reproduces very well the, all the low order and high order correlation in the network. And uh, what we work on currently is to show that the hidden units can be a decoder of the activity in an unsupervised manner, without supervision, okay? So that's something we work on and uh, it's a current work. I promise to show you that. So 
in my lab, the group of Stéphane Dieudonné has published very beautiful paper, two cell paper in the last three years, one very recently, uh, another one uh, two years ago, where he showed that using two photon microscopes in 2D, we were able to record, they were able to record uh, with voltage light in vivo in the uh, white mice. Okay, so that was beautiful result, and obviously we tried to use our 3D system because I work with Stéphane uh, with those dyes. So it works a bit, not perfectly. So you see, this is preliminary result obtained with GDI, so that's the second generation of dye. It's not the ADAP one, which was published three years ago. And with GDI, that's typically the, so we did, uh, so Walter and, and Vincent working on this project, design patterns to optimize the recordings, and you see here events, okay, which obviously are uh, spikes, okay, in the neurons, okay. So it works, we see that, but it doesn't work so well. I don't want into it to go into the detail, but there is something that I have to stress out, which because when you show new techniques, there are always some drawbacks. And there is a limitation here. What I showed you before was on sparse samples, okay? Sparse labeling, okay? And there is a reason for that. Is that because we are using an holographic illumination, we have a bit more background as compared to a Gaussian illumination, okay? Background coming from the surface, from, from you know, in two photomicroscopy, when you go deep, you have a surface generated background, which in a sense suppress the, the the sectioning ability of the technique in which has been described in scattering medium, and using holographic patterns, so pa uh, no, uh, something which is not homo homogeneous, you create background which is a bit larger, okay? Which reduce a bit the contrast that you get. So we try to work on that to, to improve this, uh, not to be limited to sparse labeling, but also to be able to work on more denser labeling, and to be also more sensitive to, to spikes, because it's not working perfectly yet, okay, to be honest. Another application that I'm like, uh, to speak about is something I'm doing with my colleague Sylvain Gigant, that some of you may know, which is working at, uh, the, at the physics department of EMS, which is wavefront shaping to do, uh, to compensate for scattering, okay? So, and I know the time is flying, so maybe I will jump to this experiment. So, um, the idea is to work, uh, to compensate for scattering, so we choose to compensate for the scattering of the skull of the brain to see whether we could compensate for scattering by doing some adaptive optics, but adapted for scattering. Okay, so you may have seen those experiments, it's nice. So we have an aberration, which is create sort of aberration, high order aberration, which is scattering due to the skull, okay? And uh, you can do adaptive optics, so to create the opposite wave front, to compensate for that and to refocus the photon at the proper place. So it's nice, but when you compensate for aberrations, low order aberration, it works correctly. When you work with scattering, there is a strong limitation, which is the fact that if you try to compensate for, thi so this is raw images obtained through the skull without compensation, and if you compensate on this point, uh, you can, so I won't speak about the algorithm that are used, but you can increase the fluorescent in this point, but the correction is valid over a very small field of view, which is of the order of a diffraction limited spot, in fact. So those neurons, in fact, here are less well imaged with the correction. Okay, so what we use here as a proof of principle is the fact that in fact, since our system is extremely fast, we can learn the correction for every point or subfield, and then we can scan the field by changing extremely fast the correction, okay? So here we had a correction for this point, another correction for this point, another correction for this point and this point, so that at the end, you get a fully corrected field of view for scattering. And this is, is this is to show that with AOD you can do funny things because they are so fast, you can do XYZ scan plus wavefront correction, and you can, for every single pulse, change the phase that you apply, so the correction you apply, okay? So this is an application, that obviously it's also a bit complicated to because you have to learn the correction, it's not so, so easy to do, but it, it's, it's promising and we have a paper in, in preparation of, uh, about that. Okay, and I think I'm done. Just to, to summarize very rapidly, I wanted to, pr to show you that using acoustic optic to photomicroscope, I think we have solved one main issue, which is stability of the recordings. Even though there are techniques now to do active stabilization, which would be very interesting too, our solution is, let's say, relatively simple. Um, it minimizes motion artifacts. Uh, maximize photon yield and allow to, to really do recordings, careful recordings of the neuronal activity with suppression of neural piece contamination. <laughs> and it allows typically to keep that in mind, to record typically 20 cells at one kilohertz, wherever they are in, the, in your cortical column, or 200 cells at 100 hertz. And to end, this is a work in my 
collaboration between two teams, so my team and the team of Stéphane Dieudonné, who's here, and all the work was done by a great person, which is Walter Ackerman, which I cannot call a postdoc, but he's an incredible engineer, researcher, whatever, and uh, who has done all those experiments. Thank you very much.